Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to a brand new show that we're going to be doing here on the channel. The uh, name of this show is going to be called What If. Today's topic is going to be What If the Grunge slash Seattle scene never happened. And my guest to kind of talk about this little ranty topic here is once again from the Music Musing podcast, Craig and George Seibert. Guys, welcome once again. Great to have you on the show. Happy to be back. Love it. Good to be back, man. I love doing this stuff. It's good stuff. Cool. Cool. So this topic, so we, we actually, originally we were talking about maybe doing a handful of topics per show, but then the more we discussed it, we thought that why don't we do one topic per show and this way we can go for lengthier debates and then not, it, it maybe won't get as clouded with all sorts of different topics and what have you. And I think this topic will resonate maybe with all of us a little bit differently. I know specifically, I, I think I'm a little bit older than you guys, so for me, the grunge scene or the alternative music scene or the Seattle scene, whatever the hell we want to call it, for me was like the death knell for 80s metal. And I remember in the 80s, I was a huge metal head. And you know, you had thrash metal, you had the hair metal stuff, you had the classic metal, power metal, all this kind of stuff that was really, really popular during the 80s. And right. then, you know, a lot of these bands that came out of the Seattle scene were at essence hard rock and metal bands anyway. But there was just something in the waters going on out there in Seattle and they decided to take things a little bit differently. And it basically changed the world, right? So, and well, a lot of these metal the bands- world like, anyway. What's that? The musical world anyway. Yeah. The musical world anyway, yeah. And a, and a lot of the metal bands were just kind of left like, wow, what do we do now? Because all of a sudden we're old news and this is the, the bright, shiny new thing. So I don't know, like for me, I think it harmed a lot of those bands and some of them tried to say, were like, well, I could do that too. Right. When in reality they couldn't, I think that was a big mistake because a lot of metal bands were trying to kind of follow suit and it wasn't really what they were capable of doing best. And it, and it killed a lot of careers. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know what you guys think about, you know, how it, how it emerged. And then we can get into a little bit of what would have happened, you know, if it never came to be like what, what would or the early mid nineties music scene have been if that never happened? So I don't know what your thoughts on that. Rock, paper, scissors. Shoot. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, I would say that, that our, our time difference might have different uh, views, might show different views on this. And I, I obviously I was a big fan of grunge and that's kind of what you were talking about before is we, we're definitely gonna have different views because we were both fans of, of the, the different eras. I was still fans of the the eighties metal and the Hades hair bands and rock. And I love that stuff. And when um, grunge came along, I mean, you, I think you put it perfect. It, it killed a lot of careers at that point. It, it basically took a lot of careers of people who had put time and effort into you know, learning how to, to shred on a guitar and learning how, to, you know, hours and hours on scales and writing solos for songs. And then you got these guys that come in and they're barely playing their instruments. And again, I'm, I'm a huge grunge fan, but I know that that sound was them barely playing their instruments and screaming and getting their angst out. And I think that was probably what sold grunge the most was people being angry and a lot of I, there was a big difference between metal and, and hair bands. I mean, they kind of crossed over a lot, but a lot of the hair bands were poppy and they were hard rock bands, but they were, yeah. and, but they were fun bands. They were, you know, fun sounding bands, bands like winger and bands like poison who had this, you know, party attitude and everybody's happy and everybody's smiling and throwing confetti in the air. So where did all the ranks come from? That's what I never got. That, that's what I, that's what I was saying is I think, and, and if you look at that movement, if you look at the, the hard rock and metal movement, that was all the way across the country, all the way across the globe. You had, you know, a lot of Swedish bands and German bands and, you know, a lot of American metal bands that all were appealing to people who liked that type of music. Grunge came out of one area of the United States. There weren't any East Coast grunge bands. Yeah. If there were, they didn't really make it very big. It was all on the West Coast, all in Washington, all in Seattle area, and it just exploded. And you're right. I don't know where that, why did, were there that many people really waiting for it to be angry? I don't know. <laughs> they just, all of the entire universe of, of youngsters were just like, Oh my God, they know exactly what I've been feeling. I'm like, well, but we're all <laughs> happy and drinking beer and chasing women. Five right. years 
what exactly. Happened? But I think that's that that was the the start. It was such a stark difference. And if you look at um, I think we we've talked before, both George and I, and I think even you on one of our podcasts that you know the '60s war movement brought a really different sound into not sound in the music, but the words in the music. The words in the music kind of changed, and it really started hitting people, you know, in in heartfelt ways. And I think that's what grunge did too. But I think it was just honestly, it was timing. Six months before, six months after, I think we would not be having this conversation. Grunge wouldn't have taken off as well as it did. Because if you look at the time frame that grunge was. It was the first ooh. Iraq war. It was, yeah, right. It was that but, but same if you also, kind of 60s vibe, I think, almost. And if you also look at how long it lasted, I mean, some bands stayed, but a lot of those bands dropped off after one, two, three years, albums. And you were right into post rock or post grunge rock at that point. So I think because it was right place, right time is the only reason it got popular. I think it's the only reason it really kicked a lot of those bands out is because people were just angry at the time, found something to latch onto. And a couple bands, you know, Pearl Jam and, and Nirvana and um, uh, Soundgarden kind of still went further with it and took it a little bit further. But a lot of those bands that came out in that time frame were like a lot of the 80s hair metal bands that came out just before grunge. They had one album and they died. And then grunge had, you know, a couple bands that made it big and you had 20 bands that made one or two albums and then died. And I think it was a movement that was, it's going to go down in rock's history, but I <laughs> flick of the switch. It, it could have not happened. Right. Period. I, and not by much, but being probably the youngest of the three of us, my, my take on it was, I didn't even know what the big deal was. I was listening to angry rock and metal. And Already? <laughs> no, really. I mean, because I was listening to Anthrax and Pantera and Exodus and those bands that, that already had angst by the boatload. So when, when grunge, I guess we're going to, let's just use the, the term grunge, I guess. When, when, when grunge came about, it only affected like my buddies because they stopped wearing, you know, assless chaps and started wearing flannels and doc martens it, it really it really was to me it was tragically it was almost a fashion statement more than a musical statement because my animosity or angst or whatever in the early 90s was already being fulfilled with bands like anthrax bands like pantera bands like metallica bands like pick one of those heavier metal bands that i was listening to so i didn't I don't want to say I didn't notice as much because it was hard not to. I mean, they flooded MTV, which was an actual music video channel at the time. They flooded MTV, MTV, right? They flooded the record stores. They flooded the TV. They flooded the radio with that. And like Craig said, there's been there was a handful of bands that stood out: your Soundgarden, your Pearl Jam, your Nirvana, and Alice in Chains. And then, I mean, that was definitely a pyramid that tapered off. I mean, that was a sh that was a sharp angle, because there. When they say a movement, I think it spawned a lot of uh, wannabe bands that wanted to sound like that. And like Pete mentioned, there were bands that tried to transition and failed miserably to to go from that you know let's drink beer and chase women to oh no you know let's buy coffee and hate the world. And I think that kind of spawned in the late mid to late 90s that spawned the emo movement that really dark and depressing type of and then screamo and it kind of so i think it influenced the the ability to want to make music as much as the music if that sounds right to you guys like i think it affected more people's oh i can do that because like craig said well they, they're barely playing their instruments they're not olympian athletes i mean you cannot take i mean you can't take a you know a Steve Vai or or Joe Satriani that came out of the '80s era and compare them with somebody that anybody that played. I mean, maybe uh, Jerry Cantrell, or maybe for Alice in Chains, as far as like a, a really really intense guitar player. There's there's a big difference in the sound, and there's just a big difference in the in the following and the feel to me. And I think it's I think it, I don't if it wouldn't have happened, I still think that. Rock, there's no way the 80s hair metal rock scene could have maintained anyway 
No, and I think that's the point of this whole conversation is like, did the 80s scene go as far as it could? Because obviously, you know, in 1989, you know, Motley Crue and Whitesnake and Dokken and Metallica, these bands are still selling a lot of records. But you had, you know, MTV is just flooding the, the airwaves with really bad videos. That's a whole other topic we can get into some other day. <laughs> what if, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, you know, you had the musicality in the 80s was pretty high. So you yeah. had one of those shredder guitar players, you know, you had Satriani and Vi and Eddie Van Halen and Ingve Malmsteen and, you know, Greg Howe and Vinnie Moore and Tony McAlpine and so many other guys. And I just wonder if music hit a saturation point come 1990 that there was no way to turn but somewhere else and maybe people were just ready after all these years of screaming guitar solos and long hair and a lot of you know hairspray and screaming vocal i mean the vocalists i think the vocalists matched the the guitar work the the show and and the talent level of the singers the i mean there was it was a very very different um display i mean it was it was you know down everything was downplayed it was darkly lit it was it was heavier it was flannel it was you know it was east or you know west coast seattle scene it was rainy it was depressing it was dreary whereas david lee roth i mean if you're doing jump kicks off a you know 10 foot speaker stack i mean in chaps that's a big difference i mean it's huge and i think people just people just wanted to just sit down for a second. I, I really think it came to a point where it's like, you know what? It's still heavy. It's still great music. And it's not, I don't, you know, it's not this ear piercing shredding, you know, things blowing up on stage. It's a little more mellow. And I think that, I think that it was almost a ne- necessary downplay, I think in the music genre. And, you know, you mentioned thrash before, and I was a huge thrash fan in the 80s, and I continued to be in the early part of the 90s, too. So, you know, I was listening to Slayer and Megadeth and Metallica and Overkill and Anthrax and Exodus. And, and then I started to listen to some of the the, uh, the Florida bands cause, who were just coming out at the time. Like, you know, you had Morbid Angel and Death and, you know, all of a sudden yeah. Possessed. All of a sudden, you know, the death metal thing was starting to come out. So there, there was that real heavy, dark, I wouldn't say angst, because... I don't know. Uh, I hung it's out different. with Crash fans, and we went, and there was we weren't depressed, we weren't angry. Oh. We were, like we'd go have a good time. You Absolutely. mosh, you let out your aggressions, right? You bang your head, you did knock yep. each other over. It was a lot of fun, and it seemed like the fun got kind of like sucked out of the room when grunge became popular. And the funny thing is, most of those bands who became really popular, they didn't want to be popular. They couldn't handle fame. That's why they all half of them committed suicide and became yeah, right. heroin addicts and like you know so. For me, if grunge never happened, would we have still continued to see that kind of fun nature of heavy music throughout the 90s? I mean, it was obviously still there. There were a lot of bands still doing that, but I mean, it it wasn't in the mainstream anymore all of a sudden. Like metal went into the underground for the first time in a long time. I agree. There was a lot of underground anyways, like you said, at that point. And a lot of those bands coming up at that time i think if we're going to do the true what if 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 grunge movement hadn't started if so let's see teen spirit was what 91 92 yep sounds like teen spirit some of that era Uh, mtv had what two or three years of playing videos and then about 96 97 is where they started playing the the tv started turning to tv shows and uh what do you call it the the live people in a in a big brother not big brother what was real the world. real world the real world so they started steering that direction into to moving away from playing videos anyways so if we're going to do the what if would they have would they have latched onto some of those underground thrash metal bands instead of of grunge and and carried that for another three or four years until they dropped off it is mtv the reason that we got that grunge got killed so fast and would it have been so if those uh, they they There's wouldn't have happened it became so popular right that's what i'm saying yeah, if yeah. those wouldn't have happened if, if no, those bands hadn't made it would the thrash bands have come in and had a short life just as short as as grunge 
died off and kind of made everything after it a little bit heavier. Well, Headbangers Ball ran from 92 to 90, 98. It was like a six-year run. And they played, they played, heavy, they played heavy, heavy metal videos, yeah. but from midnight till 2 o'clock. Right, to mid, right. <laughs> So that's only the metalheads stay up late. They're up drinking beer and watching. Well, that's well, most of them are at shows, though. That's the problem. Who said no one wants this stuff? I, you know, that's that's what I meant. It's basically a like, um, that's that was the underground as far as TV was concerned. That midnight to two o'clock genre, and and nobody's even awake. So just put that, you know, put that shit on then. So I think that's where that kind of fell into that um, group where it's like nobody wants to admit that. That yeah, I mean grunge, like you said, killed hair metal. They killed that. They killed the fun. So let's put that on later. And then then they realize, well, man, everybody's liking this stuff. And, you know, it's getting all kinds of radio play, all kinds of record sales, all kinds of video plays. So maybe we should get on board. And that spawned a lot of you know, like like I said, a lot of um, a lot of. Uh, whatever the word Co- is a lot coattails of, hanging on the coattails yeah or, a lot of bands that wanted to do that and then all of a sudden it was gone then there's you know a bunch of guys standing on a street corner in seattle with you know a guitar and an amp you know look with their with their guitar case open trying to make to trying to make money because you know kurt's dead and you know and lane staley dead and you know it, it just it it turned into a i think it was very much very much needed but it i think it kind of muddied the waters to the point i don't i still don't think we've recovered from it musically that's a good way of putting it i think i think musically and i was just kind of doing a little side research as we were talking that in 93 a lot of bands came out about the same time and you know we were talking about 91 92 being um when uh smells like teen spirit came out right yeah, and but in '93 you had Stone Temple Pilots, Rage Against the Machine, Marilyn Manson, Tool, Beck, Radiohead, Weezer, Collective Soul. You had that almost almost that post grunge rock already starting. Right. So it might have been easy to miss grunge anyways if we if like you said if they would have put the stuff rotation. out there. Yeah. Yeah. If they'd have put the different rotation in that same spot, would it have just taken over and moved grunge right on? You know get out of the door you're you're done you had your 10 minutes there because even like let's say nirvana never happened soundgarden was still going to happen if you listen to those early soundgarden albums rusty cage they were playing doom metal they were they were playing like black sabbath style stuff yep rusty cage has been labeled as a metal band and they wouldn't have no problem nope Nope. rusty cage is a black sabbath song i i I, that's exactly about how i feel about it and james too they're not much different absolutely i think I think the story, the Kurt Cobain story is what sucked a lot of people in. You know, he was living on the street before right? when, you know, he was sleeping in his car when the, when the album hit or whatever, sleeping on a sidewalk. And I, whether, how much of that is true or not, doesn't, doesn't really matter. But I think that sold a lot of people on that. He became the every man that everyone could relate to, right? Or the yeah. young kids could relate to. Yes. It was a perfect storm, actually. Yeah. yeah. And it, I think that's going to be the, it, it's, it's moniker is grunge was the perfect storm. I think people glorify it a lot in their head. And I do too, because I was, I lived, we lived through that times and I was, you know, I, I was attracted to music. I love the music at the time and you know, no bones about it, but I think I look back at it and think that it was such a big thing, but it really was only three or four years of, of time. If you look at rock and metal, you know, you could say that black Sabbath was technically metal at the time. And it just kind of evolved and kept getting a little bit harder and a little bit harder. Grunge was something completely different. So I think that the rock and metal stretched out for a lot longer time than grunge did. And, you know, we could have easily missed it. We could have blinked and it could have been gone. See, I'd, I'd slightly disagree to effect because to me, grunge is rock and metal. I mean, I, I think it's just locale or feel more like, or the story behind it because I mean, did it have to be labeled something else? That's my, I don't point. think so. I think, I think they were just, we were in a quagmire of 
you know, assless chaps and and right. it was the, it was the anti hair metal for lack of a better term. That's what it yeah, was. Yeah, that that that's an easy right. way to put it. It's really it. not that far removed from a lot of what we considered hard rock and metal. It really isn't. Absolutely not. I think it's it's exact to me it's exact it's 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 heavier. The lyrics are I mean but a lot, what happened was a lot of people were like, well, this is the type of music I want to listen to, and right. I'm not going to listen to this anymore. So right. you know, all these bands who were left, you know, with their, you know, what's right. out of their zipper, and they were like, now what do we do? So you got like bands like Queensryche and Dokken and Motley Crue and all these bands trying to make grunge records. Well, that's not what you guys should be doing. Yes. And you had another band who I know you guys are well aware of named Pantera, who were putting out some really heavy, compelling music that – was angry just as angry just as uh, you know right and it's testify, like you, brother, you wonder, as big as pantera was you have to wonder if they might have been even bigger if grunge wasn't such a hot topic at the time and but, and you could you could literally take probably every band that came out i mean nirvana was a little bit before the, their big release i mean they had bleach out before in late 80s Mid, mid to late eighties, but you could probably take every band that was released at the same time or came out at the same time that grunge was kind of starting to flow and probably say the same thing. Yeah. And I think honestly, they would have gotten bigger. They would have just carried on. We might not have so much pop rock today. We might not have so much, um, you know, of, of dance music influencing the, the, because we pushed a lot of the rock and, and metal out with grunge. Yeah. If you look, if you go back and look though, uh, Pete, just to say Pantera had some teased out hair and some spandex. Oh, we, don't, we, don't we don't count the first album. We don't count the first album. Was it first or first two? We, first we just, two, I think. Yeah, we don't count yeah. those. They were yeah. the Cowboys from Hell was a completely about about face for them. Right. So like, I think they're like, uh, maybe, oh, grunge is going to hit. Uh, I know. Let's do this instead. And I think it worked. I think it worked out pretty well for them. Uh, they, they did all right for themselves too. But uh, yeah, Cowboys from Hell, nineteen ninety. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think maybe they maybe the, maybe the writing was on the wall. Maybe they were one of the few that you know, like, hey, let's trade our spandex in for you know tattoos and really dark music. And so, do we think the grunge musicians thought that, or were they really just making music they liked? Or did they, just you know, make, I think they were just making music. I, I don't think most of those bands had any clue that they were going to become superstars. I think at that point in time, I think that was the music industry that that made that happen. They're like, you know what? We cannot keep fronting these, you know, ridiculous hotel destruction bill. You know, like they're destroying. Are you, are you saying it's a conspiracy theory? Yes. No, it's not a conspiracy. It's a. I think it, that's that's my. That's my it take. Was a on decade it. of decadence and excess. I, I mean, it had to end. That's what I mean. And I think the seventies had to end at some point, right? I think the record labels were like, "Listen, we can't keep doing this. We're the money, the shows, the production is getting bigger, more expensive. They're try, you know, everything is, you know, from, you know, Townsend smashing guitars to, you know, the brown M and M claws. There's a level of too much." And I think it was grunge stripped all that away. It was just, you know, just give me a Starbucks and a flannel wrap tied around my waist and some, you know, some Doc Martens with a toe, a hole worn in through the toe. And just let me, just let me whine about, you know, how I'm feeling right now. And it's all good. Oh, uh, and, don't, 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 and don't sell my tickets through Ticketmaster. I think it took, <laughs> I think it took all the polish off of music and you know, exposed it to what it, back to what it, should have been i think maybe i'm not gonna say should have what it could have been i think rock in its purest form doesn't need that overly obsessive show front and i think that i think grunge kind of was a slap in the face to all those hair metal bands that made so much money and so much fun and did you know they you know there's a time and a place for everything so sure. you can have that kind of more simplified rock music and and have the more technical musicality um type of of music as well but i think that the general public's consensus at that time is guitar solos bad flannels and three chords good oh, yeah. and we don't need any more than that right so you had a lot you had all these musicians and bands like, what am I going to do? Nobody's interested in hearing me play anymore. Right. So, well, it's interesting because we've got kind of a resurgence of that type of sound lately as well. Again, of a lot of bands, you know, coming in and, and doing solos and 
um, you know, make, trying to make that a little more popular. And, but it's interesting. You brought up that brother about the industry kind of not supporting that, that idea anymore. And then looking for something a little more low key, but still powerful enough. That, that's a very interesting concept that I hadn't really thought about. And, you know, maybe that's why they're so apprehensive to put rock out. You know, we've all three had this discussion about where's the rock right now. Maybe that's why they're so apprehensive to put time and effort into something that's new and that's rock because of, of movements like that. You know, when you get, when you've got pop who started like with NSYNC and stuff in in, in the nineties and stuff that has not stopped, that sound has continued on and they continue to throw money at it. Grunge stopped you know, even the post grunge, a lot of those bands kind of stopped. Hair metal got cut off at the knees. Maybe they're just afraid to put money into to rock anymore, knowing what, what, what happens to it when something, you know, new comes along and just casts out everybody else. Yeah. And that, that's, that's believable. I think, I think the music industry is, is they're going where the money is. I mean, whether it's, you know, people, I mean, people are setting up their own YouTube channels to just just not i mean no no disrespect at all but i mean people are putting their to put themselves out there without producers without music industry without a label without that stuff and like it's just i mentioned um before like the stone temple pilots facebook page posted a cover of one of their songs by some young and upper coming female artist and they and so I mean, with no label, no no record to speak of, she just did a cover of one of their songs, and she possibly that I mean, who knows what what that could do for her or her career or her potential by something like that happening. I think it's I think they go I think the music industry goes where the money is. No, that, I think that's I mean that's, that's that's not nothing that's nothing new. Right, but I think the well in the late '80s, early '90s, I think they saw the well drying up with hair metal. Everybody was like, "Listen, we're just," you know, they're all. It was like the Hangover Cure, right? They're like, "Look, we've partied, we've done so much coke, so much beer, so much whatever. We need a coffee to wait. You know, we just need to like sleep for like three or four days and and have a coffee." And I think that was the grunge movement. I think it was like the sobering up of of rock, of party rock. Did I just say that out loud? You said Nirvana <laughs> is the hangover cure. You said that. No, I said, anyway, <laughs> grunge is the sobering up of but, party but if, we, if we go back to the original question, what if it never happened? I think you, you've made a good point though, brother. And, and I'll ask Pete to kind of put his input in because I know that you've, you were around for a lot more of the behind the, the before grunge than we were. So based off what my brother said, could rock have sustained its its climb if grunge hadn't happened i think i think it could have and i think it technically it did but it was just so in the shadow of everything else that was going on it would have changed it would have had to change yeah and you know i you you wonder you know i I talked about the pantera um factor before but like i'll bring up like a band like dream theater who was also breaking right around the same time that grunge was breaking with a completely different sound that borrowed from metal but also progressive rock and extreme musicality and they had a really loyal healthy following and they still do to this day but to a to a point right their albums were never going to go platinum uh they were never going to have top 20 singles or anything like that but i guarantee you that if there was no grunge happening in the early mid 90s dream theater would have been a really big band because they had the melodies they had the hooks they had the chops, they had the looks, all that kind of stuff. Yep. And that would have opened up the doors for a lot of other bands like that. You that's, stop. You that's stop where my, nope, that's nope. where my conspiracy theory Stop. Did. Stop. <laughs> I'm going to say another band that, that was around the same time and they were local to Florida, but they were getting really big. Sabotage. Take my earbuds at now? No, Sabotage. Oh, yeah. I mean, another band that was, had, was taking that, that prog idea and starting to add it into the rock feel. And they just crashed and burned because, like you said, everybody just that was came out at that time that was metal, got cut off. I mean, yeah, they, they like, had you know I'm very close to the Sabotage story because I went to high school with Chris Caffrey who played in Sabotage. <laughs> That's awesome. They were ready to become very big. Yeah. And you know one of the guitar players, John, uh, Chris Oliva, died in a yep. car accident. Yep. And the whole grunge thing happened and. All of a sudden, boom, this once promising career was like, 
kind of floundering a little bit. And then right. that morphed into Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And obviously we know how well that did. But again, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of bands, you know, King's X, another, yeah. I'm not yeah. a huge oh, wow. fan, but, but they should have, I'm sorry, they should have been huge. Yeah. It should have been huge. But again, right. they came out right at that same time. Before Faith we go any further, what was that, um, what was that King's X song? Oh man, that's going to drop. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I that was one of my favorite songs in the early '90s, King's X, and because that dude's mohawk was just killer. I, <laughs> sorry, uh, left I mean, us on a shiny object. Yeah, shiny there, object. Did you? There, there. That's my answer. I think if grunge had never happened, I think that kind of whole more progressive type music, which is a lot more mature and grown up than hair metal, would have been the next big thing. And obviously, all right. My, all right, then I'll give my take on my if if grunge. What if grunge wouldn't have happened? I think it would have the hair metal would have progressed, or the hair metal bands would have progressed to more of a pop friendlier sound to to stay relevant. Go in that direction anyway, right? To yeah, stay relevant on the radio. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it would have. I think grunge brought music back to a to a little bit more. To the uglier side of it and those of us that listen to heavier rock or heavier metal um we there's always that undertone you know that, it, that it's just not you know it's not radio friendly or they use bad words or they talk about things that are you know not not pertinent you know or they don't like it's not popular that's why it's not, popular. It's not a power ballad on the album oh, we got to change that right <laughs> right exactly yeah. so i think i think grunge brought rock and roll back to the back to the people that like rock and roll they were they were looking for that little bit dirtier a little bit more depressing side of it and i think that that fit a niche that wasn't you know cannibal corpse but it wasn't you know motley crew either i think that fit i think that fit in a niche of it was dark enough for people to still you know hold their pinky out when they're sipping their starbucks but it was, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, but they didn't have to wear zebra, you know, tight zebra pants with fringe on them. So I think in it, a weird way, it was almost like a lot of these grunge bands in a weird way. Again, I'm just using an analogy here. Part early Rolling Stones and part Black Sabbath. When you think about it, right? Agreed. Agreed. And I think if I was going to, you know, if you put it, if you matched it to a time frame, you know, would uh, my dad, I always listen to my dad talk about the hippies and their long hair and stuff. And when you look at the difference between the musicians that, that weren't, that were clean cut and, and, you know, making the rock music the way they wanted. And then you had the guys that come in with the long hair and, uh, you know, I think, uh, Motley Crue's first album, was it in the late seventies or was it 80, 81? It was really yeah, early. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. Yeah, so I mean, you had that transition phase there that that's kind of lasted for a long time, but I think if grunge wasn't there, I really think that that bands like Stone Temple Pilots and um, and Rage Against the Machine and Creed and stuff that the were post grunge grunge bands would have never happened as well. I think we would have lost that whole almost un uh, un. I, I don't want to say dumb. I, it, you, you mentioned like intelligent rock or like there was a lot more, um, not intelligent. What's the word you use? It was mature. You used a more mature sound. I think that, that the bands like Creed and bands like, you know, stained and those bands weren't very <laughs> nickelback. <laughs> they weren't, they weren't the smart, they weren't the mature rock bands that I think honestly, those would have been cut off as well. I think, like you said, we would have got bands like sabotage and like, dream theater that would have just started coming up and rising a little bit more and you would have got a little more metal and we might've had a drop off. It might've been a big cliff where you dropped back into almost nothingness and got some, some other type of grunge, but I think it would have went on a lot longer with that feel. And, and a lot of those bands that came out of that post grunge era wouldn't have existed as well. Creed stain, you know, all those types of bands. I still think talent always rises to the top. Anyway, bands like Stone Temple Pilots and, those bands, I think, would have would have come out, but I don't think they would have gotten near the radio, near the production, near the radio play that that the, you know that that they did without grunge because sure. they needed. I, I still think. I mean, the talent level was there for a lot of those bands. I mean, Sabotage included to 
you know, we keep beating the horse, Stone Temple Pilots and so on and so forth, Stained, a lot of these bands, but that, that forged for like for new metal bands in the early 2000, you know, like Corns and Limp Biscuits and so on right, and so, so forth. That, that, that I think, I mean, because if you, if you think about it, all that stuff was still happening. I mean, like Nine Inch Nails was early 90s. Yeah. There were, there were, there were sure. some of those undergr- underground bands that were, that were dark, but they were not radio polished. And I think grunge gave the music industry an out because they didn't have to play Cannibal Corpse and they didn't have to play Poison anymore. And I think that, like Craig said a number of times, right place, right time. Yeah. It would have been six months. If that had been a sliding scale, I don't think it would have, I don't think it would be, I don't think we'd have to be having this conversation if it was six months earlier or six months later. Agreed. Yep. Yep. My take on it. Cool. <laughs> well, I think we beat this one uh, pretty yeah. good. So absolutely. Great conversation. I love it. Absolutely. So, um, George and Craig, thanks for joining here in this first edition of What If, hopefully first of many. So what I'm going to pose to our viewers is if you like this format, and I hope you do because we do, uh, let us know some What If scenarios. We're going to amass a list and we're going to try and do this you know, as often as we can and uh, have fun with it because I, these are the kind of musical debates that get you thinking. We don't plan any of these. There's no scripts here, right? This is just, yeah. here's the topic and go off right so um this all right before we go any further yeah nobody nobody on music musing or sea of tranquility do not put the david lee roth sammy hagar thing up because we're gonna we'll we'll get there maybe like years from now don't do it (laughs) it's been beat Beat beat. (laughs) Uh, absolutely so guys tell us uh where the folks can find you i'm gonna let george take it this time um mu- any pretty much any social media outlet uh twitter it's music musing without the s music musing underscore is that yep. correct there you go uh without the s uh we're on facebook at craig and george cyber s-y-b-e-r-t um we're on uh was it uh liz uh www.lisbon.com no. I, you know what i'll take it music musing.lisbon.com <laughs> Lips- <laughs> lipson.com um we're also like, if you go to any platform, any where you get po- your podcast and type in music musing, you're going to find us. Um, if you're, if you don't see it on your favorite one, send us a message at uh, music musing feedback at gmail.com and we'll get you covered on that too. Absolutely. I urge everybody to check out their show. It's a lot of fun. I've guessed it on a few times and I can't you wait have. to come back. It's, it's just fun to listen to every week. And uh, you know, whether you listen to them in the car or in your office or, while you're cooking dinner, whatever, it's a great listen. So uh, make sure you tune into them. So upcoming programming, guys, we got a questions and answers show coming up hopefully this week. We are going to be visiting Steve Keeler at Rock Fantasy once again next week. We're going to be doing top 10 songs for Van, no, top 10 songs for Le- uh, Leonard Skinner, Megadeth, yes. Overkill, Santana. Ah, what else? <laughs> I'm trying to think what the other, I can't remember. Um, all sorts of other stuff. I've got part three of my concert experiences probably coming up tomorrow or Wednesday and uh, you know, a lot of great stuff and we're going to have these guys back on again. So Absolutely. we're going to start plotting some more what ifs and other, we got a whole list of other topics that we want to cover. So guys, thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you real soon. Say goodbye and uh, have a good one. Absolutely. See you guys. Thanks. So remember www.catranquility.org, Facebook, Twitter, here on YouTube all the time. Take care guys. Bye-bye. Yep. <laughs>